Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Who Am I? Helping Next Gen Find Their Place in the Family Enterprise. Some brief housekeeping before we get started. Your control panel allows you to choose how you participate in the audio portion of the program. You've joined in listen-only mode, and you will remain muted throughout the program. We welcome your questions and comments in the questions panel. We set aside time at the end of the program to address these questions, so feel free to enter questions throughout the program. We'll answer as many of them as we can during our time together. We're scheduled for 60 minutes together, including our Q&A time. Today's program is also being recorded. Shortly after the program, you'll receive an email, including the presentation slides and additional educational resources that relate to today's topic. The recording of the presentation will be available within 48 hours, and you'll receive information on how to access that recording as well. Please allow at least 48 hours to receive our follow-up email with those instructions. At the end of today's program, you'll also be asked to complete a brief survey on your experience today. We greatly appreciate your feedback and we use your responses to help us plan our future program. A couple of important notes about our conversation today. We value confidentiality. And in our work, we often use cases and scenarios to describe the concepts we're exploring in those discussions. Any cases that we share are publicly available, approved for use, or are composites for many common client experiences. And to allow for the most open participation in today's Q&A session, questions asked in the program today, we will answer using identifying you by your first name only. This is also an educational dialogue. The approaches and ideas we describe may be helpful in a number of situations, but a best practice is only a best practice if it's best for your family. So we encourage you to draw ideas from today's discussion and consider them in the context of your own situation and to consult your own advisors for guidance and support as appropriate. And with that, let's meet our presenters. Tom Amy is a consultant with FBCG that focuses on developing individuals and families in a way that cultivates leadership and helps family businesses succeed while living their mission and values. Tom works with families across generations, developing plans and curricula that support their goals with work rooted in real world experience and his educational background in organizational behavior, leadership, psychology, and mediation. Tom is based in Western Michigan. Hi, Tom. I wanna make sure, Tom, you are muted right now. So before we get started, we'll wanna adjust that. Um, same with you, Amy. Amy I am is- I'm unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. That's, I don't wanna carry this program alone. It's, you guys are the show, <laughs> start the show today. Um, Amy Wirtz is a consultant with the FBCG with a focus on building shareholder value, business planning, ownership, and leadership transition. She grew up in a family business and brings her extensive experience as an exit planning advisor, collaborative lawyer, mediator, arbitrator, lecturer, and teacher. One special area she applies, she applies these skills is in helping families fight, find peaceful resolutions to complex issues. Amy is based in Ohio. Welcome, Amy. Hi. And I am Christy Data. I'll be your host and moderator for today. And I'm particularly interested in this topic because it originated directly from Tom and Amy's work and experiences with family systems. So I am excited to hear them share some of their passion for this idea today. With that, I am going to turn things over to Tom to kick the discussion off. Thanks so much, Christy. Amy, great to be working with you. Um, folks, we're really excited to talk about this because we think it's, it's very relevant to things that matter to you. Uh, we know that all business owning families want continuity and you struggle with how to help the next generation enter the business in ways that are both peaceful and productive. So uh, we know you also want strong family relationships and a business, a strong business. And, and we believe that you can achieve both. And we help families do that all the time. We also think that one of the secret ingredients to that success is understanding what identity is. Now, identity is a word that requires just some definition, but I think it'll make sense to you. It's really how you answer the question, who am I? And understanding that we answer that question uh, time and time again throughout our lives. Uh, quick, quick anecdote to, to share just so you can illustrate it. I did a lot of pre previous life, did a lot of work at colleges and universities. Freshmen come in uh, every year. Uh, maybe you can think back to your freshman year orientation. And for some of us, that was not recent. And so uh, one year I noticed this guy walking in a freshman orientation. Now, mind you, uh, I'm in the Midwest and freshman orientation is in August. It's hot. 
and he's got his high school letter jacket on. We're talking leather See? sleeves, boiled wool, main coat body. Uh, and that's the first thing I noticed is why would somebody have a jacket on? It's hot. I mean, I was uncomfortably warm. And then the, the next thing I noticed like immediately was that it was just decked out. It's, this guy went to a school that obviously started with a W. He had W's all over that jacket and pins and medals and just, I mean, he fairly clinked when he walked. What was he doing? He was saying, this is who I am. And he was entering into an environment where he didn't quite know what the new rules were. And he didn't know who he was in this environment. And so he came in and said, look, look at me. And it, it sort of was uh, odd because it was incongruous with the weather. And, um, and he didn't actually play any sports at that particular university. The good news is, somewhat ironically, he gave up the leather jacket just as the uh, weather started to turn cold here in Michigan. But he had assumed some other identities that worked for him. We'll circle back for that. But the bottom line is that's how he was answering, who am I? And he wanted us all uh, to know it. So Amy, what do you think we're gonna do today? So we are going to talk about identity. So really a beautiful introduction time about how we need to establish who we are every time we enter into a new system. And, and that question really never goes away for us. So we're gonna talk about the importance of identity. Then we're gonna talk about how the leading generation and the generation coming up, which we will call next generations, can take proactive steps to build and strengthen and, and create resilience around that issue. Um, and why is it important we understand it and how do we make it work both for the business and the family? And then, we're going to talk about how understanding that leads to better outcomes for everybody, for all generations, including ones that aren't born yet. If we create a culture that, I, that understands the importance of this, gains some skills, it's not just for the leading and now, but it's for future generations as well. So that's how we're going to go uh, through most of this work. Um, and really, identity is sort of the secret sauce on the Big Mac. It's what makes it unique. It's what makes us unique. And understanding the dynamics of identity, how it's created and why it's important is how families transition into new generations and new leadership, both in, in all systems. So Tom, that's, yeah, that's um, what are some key... Go ahead. Well, I think it's just a great way to put it. I love that you said that we will coach you because I, I think we do this a lot with our clients is first we build an understanding around a concept, but then we stick with them through implementation to make sure they can put it into action. And we're really concerned today that you have, um, you know, practical understandings, not some theoretical academic understand, but, but you understand on a practical level. And so to, a couple things to get us there. One is just remember that you're probably asking, who am I regularly and frequently, and you may not be aware of it. And related to that, and probably simultaneously, you're also asking the question, who do I want to become or who should I be? Think about a room you've walked into and maybe you're uncomfortable walking into that room. Maybe it was a networking or a trade show or something, and you're trying to figure out who do I wanna be in this? Now, it's not like you're gonna dress like a clown versus Batman, you're still you, but there's different ways that you lead with identity. And so one of the ways that we can see that that becomes complex is we've got this three circle model that we talk about with family business. And uh, you can see immediately that in just three quick identities that one could have in a family business, obviously family, and then in the business, maybe management, and then ownership and, and governance would be yet another. And then within each of those circles, you see all the potential relationships and identities and the way that people can understand who they are, and those may shift over time, right? Uh, and so someone who's not an owner may become an owner, someone who's not in governance may, be, may come into governance, probably, hopefully, always family. Uh, but uh, so what we want you to do is understand that the system is complex and that the construct of identity is really critical to understand because it's there, whether you see it or not, but if you can see it, then you can begin to shape it. And that's really what, what we want to convince you is that there's ways to shape identity for both generations. We're going to mostly focus on next gen. But I think you've got a great story about that, uh, Amy. I do. Um, so, Tom, I work a lot in the farming industry. And 
One success story I can tell you about was a client I worked with many years ago who, um, when he went to college, their farm was a row crop farm. And uh, in the Midwest, we grow corn, wheat, soybeans, uh, our typical rotations. And they had a few animals, but not much. And he went to Ohio State and he fell in love with dairy. And he came home after his first year of college and said, hey, dad, I want our farm to be a dairy farm. So if you know much about farming, that's a huge business transition. And really the son stepping up very young saying, I have a new vision for us, right? Uh, and it was really a small farm. And that father worked with his son to create a dairy farm. And what was really neat is that he, my client and his sister, really put a lot of, of their own separate identity into creating a new way of doing business on that land. The sister became a herd master, they run it. And what's really cool is his daughter is going to food ag and she's saying, okay, we're gonna take this dairy business to even a, a newer place. I wanna make food out of the milk that we're creating mm -hmm. and I wanna do cheese and ice cream and other products. So it's kind of nice about, so he's willing to step back and let this third generation take it even into a different modality, might be a sister modality, but a different modality. And what he wound up doing was becoming the expert grain farmer to feed the cattle. The sister became the herd master with their combined talents. They have a really unique, very modernized facility. And now it seems like this next generation is gonna create their own story. So that's that's a family that has really allowed identity to shape with each generation, which is cool. That's that's a great example of a positive outcome. And it shows that you can have identity on a couple levels. I mean, I hear business level identity, but I also mm -hmm. hear dad saying, yeah, my identity is that I, I'm a farmer of this type. But then he was able to kind of step back and create space so the son can come in and say, hey, I want to be a farmer of this type. And 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 so he he became a dairy farmer. And I know so many cow related puns, I'm really working hard not to use them right now. But, um, you know, there's some there's some challenging examples we run into. Uh, yeah. I know uh, a situation where a client uh, calculates his net worth. Uh, and this this happens in a variety of ways across different families, but they sort of compare themselves to the next gen with an, an, an air of competition. So calculating net worth against dad's net worth at, at, at his age with the intent to beat him and not friendly competition, but, but sort of tearing down competition or saying, I'm gonna go into a competitor's business and we're gonna come back and beat you in the marketplace. And, and some of the identity stuff that goes on there, if you can't see it, then you don't know why it's happening and you didn't do what was necessarily early to avoid that pitfall. So before we get into the really practical suggestions on what to do about identity, we want to make sure that you're thinking about the identities that you have. And uh, so we got just a quick little reflective exercise. So we're just going to guide you through uh, the identities that you see uh, in yourself, and, and I'll guide you through these. And then we're actually going to ask you to give us feedback. So there's a question box there on your screen where you can type in information. And so as you think through these, just answer the question in the question box and Amy's going to read it out and we just want to do this kind of real-time uh, conversation as much as we can given the format. So first of all, what identity or identities do you see for yourself? And they're multiple and I'm going to give you a big hint. Um, some of us celebrated a major aspect of our identity just a couple days ago on Sunday. Okay, ready, set, go. Start putting uh, answers into that box if you would. Oh, and, and only the organizers can see your answers. So you're you're anonymous to, to everyone else on the podcast or the, the webinar. Daughter, business, mother, in-law, wife, marketer, sister-in-law, important, cancer survivor, parent, oh, wow. yeah. father, leader, second generation, mentor. So we have quite a few third generation friend, entrepreneur, administrator, coach, mother, employee, third generation employee, cheerleader, fourth generation brother, FB consultant, cheerleader, complexity. Oh, there's a lot. 
Mm -hmm. Therapeutic guide, facilitator, family member, chauffeur, dad, fortune teller, granddaughter, fifth generation, <laughs> innovator, oh, that's a good one. teacher, coach, volunteer, instigator, artist, promoter, catalyst, problem solver, referee, carb, couldn't read the last one, creative, optimist, herder, partner, second, seeker, cousin, employee, engaged, community supporter, peacekeeper. That's a tough role. That's uh, that's some great responses there. Uh, awesome. Let's let's keep it moving. I remember my fifth grade report card. I, I came home and the teacher had identified one of my identities as a class clown. And so uh, my my parents took the opportunity to shape and mold my identity in a different direction with that. So what well, what's the next one, Amy? So what is your role in your family? So when I'm talking to clients, I often say. Um, where do you fit in your family? How would you describe that role? Guide, tech mm -hmm. support, mediator, organizer, son-in-law, organizer, leader, leader, driver, advocate, therapist, convier. I did something. What's interesting is we're going to ask you to come back to family in a second and ask about the identity differences between the generations uh, of your family. And that's a fascinating conversation. We get in a room with a family and start asking this uh, kind of in real time. Let's just keep moving into the businesses. You have a business identity. What are some of your identities around business? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, in that regard. The, um, you know, I, I hear leader uh, a lot. And the idea of how one forms one's leadership identity is really important. And that's a whole other webinar that I can't wait to give. What do you see so, in there, Amy? Karen or Christy, I'm having a technical problem with yeah, the fact that my answers have disappeared. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here, I can read some out for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have collaborative leader, payroll technician, entrepreneur, custom manufacturer, communicator, facilitator or mediator, employee, board member, door opener, patriarch, mm -hmm. helper, engineer, innovator, advocate, collaborator, new employee. Okay. Uh, product ambassador, consensus builder, next gen. So the last thing we're going to ask you to uh, think about is what are the identity differences between the generations in your family? So when we think about that, just no answer is wrong here. What we're looking for is what's your immediate thought when you think about what are the identity differences between leading generation, current generation, non-leading generation that have already left if you're a fifth generation that you're paying tribute to and trying to honor, and maybe the next gen that's coming up, like the kids that aren't even old enough to really participate yet. What comes into your mind for that? Great. Uh, legacy is everything and legacy isn't everything. Ooh. More collaborative, difference in technology, change of direction of business model, patriarch trumps all, <laughs> different meaning of work, different era of upbringing, forward thinking versus backward thinking, difference in mindset of running a business, honoring tradition and pioneering change, Business growth process, dictate versus building consensus, new ways to communicate, entitlement, different life drivers, risk tolerance, connection to founders and leaders and openness to change, 
uh, more data driven, age gaps, entrepreneurs versus businessmen, uh, difference in trust in non owner family managers, uh, different priority on education, inclusivity, passion for the business. The, uh, the, as I listen to that list, I'm, I'm interested in how many of those populate in the concept of how one sees leadership, that patriarch, and patriarch is right. Uh, there's so much there. Uh, we don't have time to, to get into it in this one, but just even leadership identity and how that plays out between the generations is a significant variable that if you're not aware of it, um, it, can, it can be a stumbling block. Uh, Amy, go ahead. So I would say, you know, what we're trying to do as we're making this move forward, as we're trying to help you illustrate the roles and the differences in your identity is we really want you to understand that this pull and push between generations happens all the time. It happens in families that don't own businesses and it happens in more systems when you own a business. So as you saw in the three circle model, for me and my family, we don't own a business collectively. So for me, it's you know the parent child, the grandparent child, it's all those roles. But when you own a business and you put that on top of it, the push and pull happens in all three systems. So we're really at a fork in the road, like this transition and helping our future generations and our current leading generation work on their identity can be a positive for the family or can create a lot of tension that's very negative for all involved. And what we want you to do is understand that there are ways we can help you through this and you can help yourself. That question, who am I, and understanding your process of identity development doesn't stop when you graduate high school. It doesn't stop when you graduate college. It doesn't stop when you become a business owner. It is a lifelong journey. And if you think about that and the fact that we have to keep it forward as we're working through our different stages in life and respect that every generation is going through that. And quite honestly, it's used in family businesses a lot, either positively or negatively. And what we want to do is figure out how we can give you tips and benefit you to work on this on your own and also ask for help. So, Christy, if you could advance to the next slide, we're going to talk about how we work on this work. Um, I'm a lawyer. Lawyers often, and that's one of my identities, which I mm. have disrobed from. I now say I'm a recovering lawyer, Tom. And <laughs> one of the things that people say to me most often is, you know, Amy, you're not like lawyers. Like, I don't understand how you were ever a lawyer because our lawyer, our all lawyer does is, is really tell us about our problems. And this is why people don't like lawyers. So one of the things I've had to do is kind of say I'm a recovering lawyer because I like to solve problems and I like to I like to give solutions, not just point out issues. So what we're going to do is, is really come up with how do we have solutions. There are four things we're going to give you as tips today. One is create space and be intentional about this work. Make a plan. We know as uh, coaches and consultants that when people write out a plan, they're much more likely to make it happen versus just keeping it up here. Putting it on paper, being intentional about it makes it more successful. The next step is we are gonna show you how to be flexible and model being patient and how those two things really are important to this work. The third one is how do we seek and create wise, guides for the next gen and the current gen for the identity changes that are going on. And the last one is don't withhold blessings during this process. Um, giving your kids pay raises isn't always what they need. Giving them praise in the appropriate place and time is usually what they're seeking. Also, hey, next gen. <laughs> It's a two-way process. If you want space to grow, you have to give it as well. So both, it's a two-way street to give blessings. So we're gonna talk about those things as we move on. 
Yeah, I think I think this first point of creating space and be intentional and making a plan uh, is essential. Um, we can't the the big picture. Every time I've seen a succession transition go well, is is the theme is always because someone with a lot of power and experience, typically the leading and now generation, steps back and says, "I can keep doing this. I've got a track record of success. I am an entrepreneur." See the identity themes there. But they're mm -hmm. willing to say, I'm willing to sort of take a, a step back from meeting my identity needs and allow you to step into the space. And so uh, there's a couple different ways that people make a plan. And, and I you know, come from a background in higher education, so I'm always thinking about a curriculum and measurable outcomes and, and how we can really help people feel like they're making progress toward an agreed upon goal and being inclusive around that uh, is, is really important. Uh, I know of a family that brings in uh, national speakers and they have a rich curriculum and they spend all kinds of resources on it, but you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. No, you don't, Tom. Um, in, in complete opposite of that, I worked with a family for a while and they did a family retreat last summer where they just had a cabin at Cedar Point, which is a, a local amusement park, and they had um, themselves the owners, which is a husband and wife team with four daughters, their husbands and all their grandchildren. Now their grandchildren were ranging from three to almost 14. And the way that they were trying to work on leadership and development of, of everyone was to introduce the concept of failure. And really just after lunch, we sat in a circle, everybody kind of sat in the living room and the grandparents had that issue to talk about. And what they did is they talked about all of the things they failed at before they got to the business they're at. And they told a story that not even their kids have heard, which was their very first business as a married couple was a worm farm and how they started by trying to sell live bait and how the worms uh, got out and all died and curled up and dried out. And the grandparents, the grandchildren from three to 14 thought that was a riot. I mean, they really thought it was funny and it was nice to kind of break the tension around a subject. And then what was cool was then the second generation shared with their children things that they had done both in business and personal lives that just didn't work out. But then they also talked about the lessons they learned from it. And what was really neat was at the end, the kids started talking about what they have failed at and what that taught them. And really as a family, they started to talk about, well, how do we put this into our daily lives? And one of the things they talked about was, how about at dinner time, instead of just asking what you did right that day, let's talk about what you learned from making a mistake, right? And so they're trying to in integrate, or, um, trying to accept the fact that failure is part of life and it's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. So that didn't cost very much money at all. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple ideas that we've talked about and this ability to talk about failure uh, shows uh, sort of a healthy identity development is, is I'm not so wrapped up in you seeing me as a successful entrepreneur that I have to avoid talking uh, about the times where I wasn't successful as an entrepreneur. So that that's a way of contributing to a fully developed identity of the next gen uh, as well. And, and you and I have spoken, and I'm just gonna pick up the pace here a little bit so we stay on track, but you and I have spoken about the value of family charters, um, a values process in families, how families can articulate uh, what their values are and teach them. Uh, and then intentional leadership skills develop that reinforce a culture and a value both in the family and in the business uh, that people uh, want to support. And, and I think one way that I saw some of this happening in a really rich way recently is a situation, very successful entrepreneur who did just what I said, step back and created space for the next gen and was using words. So he had a great idea, probably gonna make a lot of money, um, but it's entrepreneurial, so there's risk. And and he did two things. He said, I want this to be we, not me. So That's hear impossible. the identity stuff there. This is about our family, not about me continuing to reinforce my identity as an entrepreneur. And I want this to be an educational learning process. So it's not just about how much money we make and how little time, but the fact that the next generation can have learning space in there. Now, we're developing the steps along the way so there is the greatest chance of both that family harmony and the educational outcomes that lead to business success. And so some of my coaching with dad is, your identity is entrepreneur, 
Sometimes the next gen, even in a business setting, might need to hear the voice of their father. And let's talk about what that looks like and how do you uh, read the room and, and respond that way. So that's just one example that frankly, when he started to say, I want it to be we versus me, I, I just, uh, I was so inspired by that. Our we that's, versus me, yeah. That's awesome. And you know, I can't imagine Tom working with him, how much you had to talk to him about being flexible and patient in implementing that idea. So that's our next step that we're gonna talk about is learning how to be flexible and patient with one another. So Christy, if you could advance the slide, please. Thanks. So why is it important for that to occur? And one of the things I always coach my clients about is you know, if you want someone to give you patience and you want someone to give you flexibility, you have to do it too. And one of the challenges I find, um, one of the great challenges and things that kind of excites me from a teaching standpoint is when um, an incoming generation says to me, I have all these great ideas. I just need dad to get out of my way. Or I just need mom to step aside and let me be the president. And this person is 26 years old and two years out of college. And they're just so excited. They want, they want things to happen quickly. And what we talk about is pacing. I use the word pacing. And that we have to understand the pacing of transition and gaining respect for one another. And also giving as much flexibility and patience as you want. So it's kind of a two-way street. Do you see that very much, Tom? I do, and I think the biggest takeaway uh, from this section is that uh, that everyone needs to be patient and flexible and, and communicate almost excessively, right? Just really be open about what you're hoping for, what you need, what you see happening. And, and of course, we teach those skills in real time, but uh, this idea that, that um, that someone who's never retired before is going to be able to pick a date in the future and know exactly how it's going to feel as they get closer may require some process and if we handle that with kindness um, and take care of them so we aren't bashing their identity then i, I think they may actually uh, be able to transition more effectively and of course um, the patients with the next gen as they develop right uh, there's a learning curve and I've said this to more new president next gens. I can't keep, I can't, I don't know how many times I've said, I've said it so often. I say to the new president who's like 32, hey, you get a learning curve. Don't forget that. Everyone else has had a learning curve. You get a learning curve. And it's really important to understand that is they, they need to be able to step into it. I don't care how good the development is. They still need a learning curve because it's different when you're actually carrying the mantle of uh, the responsibility. Uh, th the other thing I think it's important to say here is, is that sometimes the issue of change gets problematic. Sometimes change is brought for change's sake, and yeah. uh, it's tough to say that's one generation versus another, but when change for change's sake uh, can be a way of reinforcing my identity as a change agent, or it could right. be me, my way of reinforcing my identity as a good leader who brings new ideas. But it also can be an opportunity to resist change just because it's change, and that's not helpful either. So if you're a now gen and the next gen's bringing some ideas, frame it as this learning opportunity. It's not necessarily an indictment of everything you've ever done in your life. And I can see the leading gen get a little defensive. Well, why does he want to change it? Don't don't they think I've done a good job? Yeah, they're trying to contribute, right? And so that's where some of the identity stuff, if you're not aware of it, can get confusing. I think that's a great example and, and uh, I'll do a quick one where uh, I, I was working with a family where the next generation really wanted to take leadership and and the struggle in that family was the owning generation wanted the next generation to act like owners when they weren't owners and they mm. were struggling with you know the, the leading generation was saying they need to act like owners and the next generation would say but we're not owners and every time we act like owners you get mad so we can't win right so the the what happened was we coached them into reversing roles on a very large project right so they were implementing a new project and the owner generation said this is your project you are in charge of it i will be over here and what happened out of that project, and it was a big project, it was a painful project, it was a software implementation and manufacturing, which mm. 
is a lot, right? It, but what happened was yeah. every time they went to dad and said, will you do this? He said, no, you, you solve it. I'm over here if you're going to fall off the rail and, and the business is going to go under, but you do it. And so they got to feel the pressure of being in charge with him right next door. Does that make sense? Oh, and absolutely. he got to feel what it was like not to be in charge. And what happened is out of that developed a huge respect for the other's perspective. And that's what we're trying to cultivate over and over, right? Yeah, yeah you're it, right. It was great. And, and really out of that came the idea that, hey, maybe we need an interim CEO between the generations while mm. the incoming gets better at that and the outcoming can kind of go right so that the, there are different ways to develop that perspective but it was a great learning opportunity for everybody I, i'm um, aware of your story of how new possibilities emerge if we would be patient and flexible and just engage with each other uh and, and i think that's a great illustration uh, so that new ceo they're really looking for that person to be a different kind of guide for the next generation so that there's new ways of doing things and new mentorships created. Have you seen that be really important in this work, Tom? Getting someone involved that's different than the leading generation to help the next generation form an identity? First of all, masterful transition, because that's our next point, wise guides, which I, I noticed earlier, you kind of chuckled. It sounds like we're saying wise guys, but we're yeah. saying wise guides. And, and we wrestled with how to use this language because it does sound like that, but, but you, you need more than someone who knows stuff. You need knowledge plus experience, which equals the wisdom. Right. And one of the things that we notice with uh, the families we work with is wisdom is found in a variety of places. It could be uh, someone who's not in the C-suite. It could be someone who's been on the factory floor for 40 years, and they have the wisdom and the historical understanding of what really makes the culture of your organization special. It could be someone outside the company, and it could also be a peer of the next generation. Sometimes we mistakenly equate wisdom with old, and there are old people who aren't wise, and there are wise people who aren't old. And so we really invite people as they develop that plan, which we made, which is our first point, develop the plan is, is what are some of the guides and who are they along the journey that can really pour into uh, the next gen? Uh, and then uh, even as the now gen can look to people who've successfully, uh, successfully transitioned out of a business uh, on how to do that well. And, and of course, governance is a major uh, variable yeah. there. Very much. And I think what's really interesting here is some of this work is is allowing people to go find guides. And, and in our conversations getting ready for this, Tom, we talked a lot about you watching young people find guides in the work that you did when you were in college education and right. kind of helping them find mentors. And I have found in my own life, you know, I have a mentor that's been with me since I was probably nine years old. I still use them. I'm 54 years old. I like, I still use guides because even as we transition into the next phases of our lives, having someone who's been there, done that is really nice. But the other thing I work a lot with is peer groups and peer groups and peer learning mm -hmm. can become critical to uh, understanding the transitions and the creation of identities and the struggles that we have. Have, you know, we run peer groups at FBCG and we find them to be super helpful in not only those that are coming up in the business, but those that might be transitioning to having a board of directors or being the president of the board for the first time and those kind of things. Has that worked for you in your consulting practice as well? It has, and this is just occurring to me as you're speaking is, and this is this is deep identity stuff, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things that we can see is if someone is forming their leadership identity and they want to prove they're competent, somewhere along the line, people learn and this is a mistake, that leaders can't ask for help. And leaders yeah. know all the answers. And, and of course that's wrong. And, and, and eventually life will beat that out of you. But asking for help, i.e. seeking a wise guide, shifts your mindset that says, I'm always looking for solutions outside of myself. We are better than me. And I'm, I'm reminded of how uh, that entrepreneur I mentioned is approaching his family with that ethics. So even just shifting your mindset to ask others for help is a, 
is a is a great kind of uh, ethic to develop, a great discipline, a great practice. All right, our final point. So our final point is um, don't withhold your blessings. And I think that this is really crucial. Um, affirmation is sometimes worth more than gold. So a personal story, um, my dad was a college prof. He spent a lot of time bragging to his friends about my accomplishments, but very rarely told me how proud he was. And I'd be out with his friends and, oh, your dad told me the story and he was you know, so proud of you. And I would look at them and go, really? <laughs> now, my dad believed that the way to push someone was to really show them where they needed to improve. Like his theory was when you do an employee review, you never give like all five stars, you always give three and a half because you want that person to know they still have room for improvement. Nobody's ever perfect. That's great. But I think being the next gen in a family business, Tom, can be really hard. And the reason is some people believe that if you're a family member, they're so afraid of looking like you're getting a leg up, they actually make it harder on their family members. They well, want everybody else to know that they're not giving their family special privilege to the point where they're actually hindering the growth of their special privilege of being a family member. Have you seen that? I have, and this is where we see some of the resentment and competition that's very negative. Uh, one of the things that I see a lot is, is that uh, the now generation doesn't know how to express affection and they don't want to be seen as being too soft on the next gen in uh, the business setting. And just like you said, the pendulum swings too far the other way. Eventually, uh, the next gen starts to feel abused, sidelined, unappreciated, uh, harassed. And uh, that can lead to uh, a really co a significant conflict, not just in the business, but uh, you, you got families that don't even get together anymore because of, of this. And so that's really fixable. I mean, it, once you understand what's going on and, and you get a family together, uh, you know, to who's willing to reconcile, and you and I each have done uh, some work with families to try to bring them back together. Um, sometimes the big win with a client is, is that they're finally getting together at mom and dad's cabin for the 4th of July, right? Because right. they haven't done it for five years because of the issues we're talking about. This, yeah. this notion of the blessing, uh, you can find that in ancient literature. This is not a touchy-feely thing. This is real. And you need to hear from the earlier, from the previous generation that we, that they believe you can do it. And it doesn't hurt at all if the next generation is saying to the leading generation, thank you. We stand on your shoulders. We're grateful for the contribution that you've made to our future as well. And that doesn't cost a lot. And I think we need to remember that neuroscience has proven over and over again that mm. it takes seven blessings to be able to erase a criticism. Yes. So if you start with talking to your kids about, hey, you did this wrong. Remember, it takes seven things that you're saying that they did right for them to believe in themselves. And so how we deliver it, the communication coaching that we do around this subject is huge. Mm -hmm. Typing of the way that people prefer to be communicated with. Do they need a public or do they need it private or do they need both, right? Yes. Uh, I, you know, saying to the board of advisors, my son, my daughter did A, B, C, and D, and this is how it affected the business is huge. Also, sitting down privately and saying, I saw you do this in the meeting. I want you to think about how that might resonate. How, mm -hmm. What were you thinking when you did that? Or ask questions instead of coming to a conclusion right away. Those are and the ways that we coach people. What are some other ways? Being a wise know? guide, right? Um, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, let's let's move into conclusion. See if we can get some questions. Okay. So we really just finished talking about the following things: why identity matters, how process and outcomes can happen very dramatically different when you use the four steps we talked about, and then why guides can help. Right. So remember, Tom, what is identity? Again. It's the process, uh, a lifelong process of, of asking and answering, who am I and who should I become? Okay. We talked about um, making a plan and having an intentional process for doing this work. 
we talked about um, how creation of identity is a lifelong process. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we talked about why working on this subject can help us become more successful in our business system, our management system, and our ownership systems, and how complex all those layers become, and how we have to really think about what 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 system we are working in when we're working on these issues. And lastly, we talked about blessings and guides and how important that can be into the development and successful transition of uh, people coming in and out of the business and people coming in and out of the family systems. So we would really love to help you work on these things. Um, what questions can we answer for you all at this point? Christy, okay, yes, we're going to yep, we're going to jump into Q&A um, for those of you who have a question that you haven't popped into the uh, questions box yet. Do that right now. Before we go into that, I'll, I'll just point everybody to a couple additional resources. Um, you can find on our website not only uh, information about this webinar, past webinars, and practically any topic, family business under the sun that you're interested in. It's under the resource section on our website or use the search bar. Um, we've recently launched a YouTube channel with a variety of interviews um, with both family businesses and uh, with conversations like this uh, among advisors to family businesses about some key family business topics. Uh, we welcome you to follow us there. Uh, and then, you know, if you follow, if you join the Family Business Advisor newsletter, which you'll also find on our website, uh, you'll get notices of upcoming programs like this that you can participate in. And uh, with that, we're going to go into Q&A. We've put up the contact information now. But let's spend some time on questions. Um, I did notice a lot of energy around this idea of blessings. Uh, so there's a few questions in here. Uh, let me pull out a couple. Um, so how do you, this is a question, um, how do you get the now generation to appreciate and make it easier for the next gen and not let that sense of fairness overshadow it. I, you know, there's a balance to be struck, right? So how do you to help the leading generation strike a balance between being, you know, critical and fair and developing uh, the next generation and then and also giving them the blessings? I, ahead, I have Tom. two things really quickly. Uh, first of all, modeling is powerful. Uh, if you do the behavior you want to see, often you'll see it returned. So that that's simple. I, I, I say that with some empathy because that's hard. If you haven't received a well done uh, from the older generation, it can build resentment. And one of the things we do is, is help reconcile that. Uh, the second thing of it is, is some of these wise guides may be peers of the now generation and they may sidle up to the now generation and say, it wouldn't kill you to say thank you. It wouldn't kill you to say, hey, that project, you nailed it. Two simple solutions. I give you an example that I'm on a board and um, we specifically put someone on this family business board that has been through multiple family transfers. He's a fifth going to sixth and we made him the mentor for the next gen and he's got a great relationship with owning gen and has done exactly what Tom has talked about for the owning gen. Yeah. But also has coached the entering generation to do the same. Yes. And one trick that I use if if I'm hearing from the leading gen that the next generation is not honoring what they're being given or I, I hear the word entitlement a lot, but really what it is, I think about recognition and respect for where the owning generation has been. I use storytelling and I have the so if there's a generation underneath the incoming generation i have that generation interview the leading generation right now to get the story of their ownership and then they present it and everybody kind of acknowledges the journey that the owning generation has gone through i often have them ask what was it like when you came into leadership either they're uh, creating generation or next and that helps them see what worked for the leading generation, what they don't want it to be like for the next generation and help kind of move into that plan. And we talk about, was a that a boy part of your culture and your family or not? 
maybe we just need to start it now because it's never been there. Great. And, and if I could just add, Krista, you're doing a fabulous job as president of FPG. See what I did there, everybody? It's not that hard. And she is. My, she is. My next, my next question was going to be, can from Ari, can you give some more examples of how you might give positive feedback? So thank you for modeling that. Um, but, <laughs> but, but really, you know, if um, can you can somebody walk somebody through an example of of maybe where there's a developmental point or or the kind of feedback that's that's going to be powerful and meaningful for someone to receive from somebody else in the family system from the leading generation. I'll give you an example because I could have just stood up and hugged my client for this. So we were laying out the succession plan to their team of advisors. And this particular business was one that was going from um, a patriarch to four daughters. And it's an industry where there aren't a lot of women. All right. Mm -hmm. And their advisors were questioning whether women could lead and own a business in this industry. Now I want y'all to picture why that might be happening, but what was so phenomenal was that this patriarch looked at his advisors and said, you know, I gotta tell you, I actually think my daughters are more qualified to lead in this industry than I am. They're more likely to be aggressive, blunt, straightforward, and get the job done than me. What I've learned through this succession plan is I care way too much about people's feelings and not enough about the business. And what we're trying to do is strike a balance. So just because they're women doesn't mean they're pleasers. They're capable, they're strong, otherwise they wouldn't be at this table. And I, I the women in that room, his daughters, you could just see like their acceptance of this and acknowledgement of their skill, it was beautiful. It was very, it was only four other people in the room, but wow, that was powerful, right? And it wasn't staged, that. it wasn't so, thought about. Yeah, that went beyond uh, sort of giving feedback to advocacy and that right. is powerful. Yeah, he was sticking up for them uh, on several of their identities as women, as his daughters, as competent business professionals. I mean, he was just, oh, what a great example. Hit it out of the park. <laughs> so a, a couple of questions about the idea of mentors and wise guides. Um, and I'm gonna draw from a couple of people who have posed this question on, on who's the right person to play this role. So for instance, is it better for this for, for someone to serve as a mentor and guide if they're a non-family employee versus a family member? Um, also, are these people in the business, out of the business? Do you need some collection of that? How do you think about where to draw the right guides from? Well, my, my answer to your question is yes. Uh, yeah, I assume you're, you're, you're a family business in a complex uh, external environment uh, in a global society. And so a lot of data points are useful. Now, now the person can't be in mentoring meetings 40 hours a week, but I think, first of all, be willing to have a number of people uh, involved be willing to have those people rotate so it doesn't have to be the same person for 20 years. And third is have those people already show some level of commitment to things like family values, uh, documents that you have that are maybe around culture. Uh, Amy had mentioned the uh, family charter before. So there's some sort of resonance with who you are, right? Yeah, and, and I see it in all kinds of ways. So I work a lot in the farming community. I work in the RV and campground industry. Those industries have peer groups that are, are designed by, by their trade associations. That's a great way to look at that, right? The other way is look at family business centers uh, locally by you. Many, many communities, I know Grand Rapids has one, I know Toledo has one, I know Chicago has one. It's a great place to find places to find mentors. Get involved in a charity. Um, you know, and, and even in the young people have, if you can, can kind of push them, I'm talking young, like high school, right? Um, get them to be a leader in 4-H, get them to know their coach, get them to know a special teacher. You get to need to know those people to make sure you want them to be that involved with your child's life. But modeling mentorship for, for them with other people is a good way to do that and having mentors in your life. So for me, it's been all of those things. It's been um, 
lawyers I've worked with that were older than me. It's been people, parents, friends. I, I have an, eight, eight, an almost 19 year old daughter. Some of my really, really good friends are mentors to her so that they can talk to her about things. We all need a tribe. So I think yes to all of those. Um, and starting young is really important. I think an, another example is uh, to be creative is that many families have um, stewardship as a value and they want to give back to their community and they maybe have a foundation board and then they sit on the boards of the nonprofits they support. Uh, as, as the next gen is younger, they could be mentored by key people within that nonprofit community so they can really understand uh, the reason for the nonprofit, understand more who's being served and why and what those needs are. And so by the time they get to say the foundation board, they've got this fully developed view of the problems that we're trying to address in society as opposed to sort of an arm's length caricature. So it doesn't just have to be somebody who's really good at finance or really good at M&A. Perfect. So we're going to do one more question. There are a bunch of questions still in the queue, and, and some of them are sort of tangential to the topic. So we will have an opportunity to follow up with you. You know, there's a survey that you'll fill out at the end. If you want us to reach out to you directly, you know, check the box and give us your information. We'll do so. Um, but the question that we'll handle last year, and it's a little bit touchy, but I think it's important. Um, th this is this says we have a very involved next gen marketing leader. This person's older sibling is president and they're struggling with their identity. What would be some things that the family could do or that this individual could do to, to manage how they're thinking about how they fit into the family and the system? May I so, take that, Amy? Yeah. I, my first idea is to have someone assist them each individually to, to have them lay out what their struggles are. Be that someone in the family that's seen as an elder mediator, like one of the identities I saw listed on what your role in the family is mediator, individually sit down with them and say, help, you know, let's draw out what it is that you're struggling with with your identity, where you fit it, and which system are we playing with, right? Now, if, if that's been done, it's been unsuccessful, I would say bring a professional in. I know Tom does some amazing coaching on um, this work and uses Enneagram to help people, has various tools to work with them individually. I personally use DISC and a lot of the Wiley products to help people with this. Sometimes you just need an outside eye on the issue in perspective that has done this repeatedly with other people that aren't part of the system to make the wheels get greased and the solutions start occurring and the communication start working. Some of it might be just the the old, and, and Tom, I know you work with this a lot, the old family dynamic that is actually showing up at work, right? So how much family stuff really needs to be talked about versus business stuff, or is business stuff invading family systems? And so those are, we really first talk about what bucket are we working in? What circle is this in? And sometimes it's multiple, but you need to break the issues down so that you can have them move forward and not be stuck. Tom, anything you want to add to that? Uh, you know, the, that question uh, both kind of hit me in the heart because that sounds like it's a really difficult process for not only the individual, but the, those around them. Uh, and uh, so I, I had more questions. Uh, this is going to sound like an egghead statement, but but let me unpack it. Uh, all identity is contextual. In other words, I form the answer to the question, who am I and who should I become in relationship with others? And so when I see someone struggling with identity, either now or in the past, something in the messages they got about those answers to those questions didn't work well. And so sometimes we have to figure that out. And you mentioned the Enneagram. That's a tool I use to help people understand some things around ego and motivation and identity. And it's very illuminating. I use that with a number of family systems with great success. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't wanna to read too much into the question, but I, I also think it ties back to the slide we did earlier with the three circle model, right? So um, we have an identity within our family. We have an identity within the business. We have an identity within owner ownership and and all these things interrelate 
and and sometimes it's a question of helping next gen find their place where they feel important as as a contributor and so on and so forth within that yeah. broader system whether or not it's within the business and that yeah. can be for those who work in the business or those who don't right yep. uh, that's well said very well said okay well that was it for us today i want to thank the audience for being with us today and being attentive through this program again please stick around fill out the survey we do appreciate your feedback thank you very much. Amy, Tom, thank you both for being here today. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity. Bye, Appreciate everybody. everyone attending. Hope we'll see you all at a future program. Have a wonderful day. Bye.